Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church, Fort Smith, Arkansas, on this beautiful May 14th Mother's Day. Please take a moment to greet the people around you. Okay, let's open our hymnals to our opening hymn, number 486, and sing, and sing together, Who is my mother, who is my brother? Please review the back of your bulletin for the week's announcements. Um, Disciples Men's Fellowship meet at 6.30 tomorrow night. That is a meal and a speaker and a good time for all. I encourage men to gather for those relationships. Um, we will honor graduates next week. And if you have a graduate, please let the office know by tomorrow so that they can be included in the celebration. Youth have a yard project next week, and they are accepting volunteers to help. So if you're so moved after church next week, you can go do some good. 
Sign-up sheets for the June 4th Naturals game are in the Northex, and you got one more week to decide. It, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we also lift up the family of Lillian Slater in the loss of, of and in her passing. Uh, there will be a graveside service May 25th at 10 a.m. at the National Cemetery. Connie is with us this morning. Know that we lift you up and love you. Anybody else got anything they need to say? Okay. Oh, John Foster. On behalf of the Foster family and the Edger Center, we have Whitney, Patrick, and of course the noble Warrior Warren John. He went home two days ago. Oh. And uh, the doctor said early in the, in the process of this whole event, this, this young boy is special. Warren John received a liver transplant and is doing good. That's wonderful. Thanks. Today we're going to honor all the amazing mothers in this church, so it's going to take a little while. So I, I prepared a little speech about history. Actually, John, John Mundy prepared it, so I won't take the credit for that. But this is kind of some interesting facts about the history of Mother's Day. So like mothers themselves, the concept of Mother's Day has been around since ancient times. The Greeks held an annual festival to Sibele, a mother of their gods. And the Romans actually held an annual matronalia celebration in honor of Juno. But believe it or not, a formal Mother's Day was not a part of our ca calendar and culture until 1914. That is not to say that mothers were never important to our nation. In fact, when John Adams was working on our Constitution, his wife Abigail famously urged him to remember the ladies. And as the 19th century dawned, women were in the forefront of our nation's expansion whether it was speaking out for human rights or tending their families as they drove across an unmapped West. But in the hustle and push of these great movements, our nation never quite got around to marking a special time for a Mother's Day celebration. That is until the turbulent second half of the 19th century, one of the most poignant chapters in America's women's history. Indeed, our official holiday was inspired by Anna Jarvis in honor of her mother, Anna Marie Reeves Jarvis, a homemaker from West Virginia and an unsung hero of the Civil War. In 1861, as the Civil War broke out, Anna Marie Jarvis and her husband were living in Grafton, West Virginia, a small town perched right on the border of the North and South. Throughout the war, soldiers from both North and South came through town on major railway lines. An estimated 10,000 troops were encamped around Grafton, many of them in a field right across from the Jarvis home. For Anne Marie's community, the conflict, the conflict was even more complex because it was not unusual for neighbors and even close relatives to have sons fighting on different sides. In the midst of this crisis, Anne Marie herself, the mother of 11 children, led women's friendship clubs of fellow mothers who pledged to help every soldier, whether blue or gray. She saved thousands of lives by nursing wounded troops and by teaching sanitation techniques, which are still new at that time. After the war, Anne Marie again stepped up to lead her community in a special day-long service to honor soldiers and their families from both sides. In 1907, two years after Anne Marie's death, her daughter Anna began a crusade in her memory. The first official Mother's Day service was held on May 10th, 1908 at the Jarvis family's longtime church, St. Andrew's Methodist Episcopal in Grafton. Anna donated 500 white carnations, symbolic of the pure love in mothers' hearts for a day, to brighten the lives of good mothers, to have them know we appreciate them, though we do not show it as often as we should. Anna's inspiration caught on quickly. By early 1914, a Mother's Day holiday had been declared in 46 states. On May 9, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson, honoring Anne Marie Jarvis and all the other women who had given so much to our nation, proclaimed it a national holiday. 
So today, to all the mothers, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for all mothers, for the new ones who endure sleepless nights with infants in arms. For the busy ones who juggle the pressures of home and family life, for the steadfast ones who nurture and care for our special vulnerable children. For the patient ones who always seek to forgive and engage with their preteens. For the persistent ones who cleverly find new ways to connect with their many adults. For the mothers and who step to cradle their nieces and nephews. For all the grandmas who love and support their precious grandchildren. For the foster moms that are called the gathered of comfort, the fragile ones. For the Sunday moms who care for our children and lead them in faith. For the moms who give far beyond their own resources, who overcome disability to cherish and love. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all our beautiful mothers. Help us, help us to support them and keep them in our prayers. May you bless them now on this spe very special day. Amen. Amen. One of the things we uh, we do want to make sure to say out loud and be intentional with is that we are celebrating Mother's Day today, and mothers hold a special place in so many of our lives, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that everyone's situation is unique. And so one of the things that I heard in the youth's prayer that, that I love and want to just re-uplift is that motherhood and motherly love looks like a lot of different things. My hope this morning that we can all reflect and we can find times when all of us, men and women, those with children, those without, whatever your situation looks like, uh, that we could find times in our lives when we've both given and received motherly love. But with that, let's go ahead and transition into the church rejoicing in good news. This is our chance to share birthdays, anniversaries, good news of all kinds. You get an easy pass today. You can just celebrate your mother if she's here with you today. What do we got? Yeah. Granddaughter number one, Sarah Lynch, is now Mrs. Michael Shepard. As of 5 o'clock yesterday, and they're probably landing in Canton right now. Amen. Yay. Oh, yeah. Mary Beth and I celebrated a wedding anniversary yesterday. Amen. Yay. Oh, wedding anniversary? Yes, sir. <clears throat> it's Tuesday. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, amen to that. I'm glad you found out ahead of time. <laughs> what else do we have? We have a lot of visitors. We do have a lot of visitors. Good. We won't put you on the spot, but we're glad you're here. <laughs> Cliff had a birthday last week. Oh, amen. Happy birthday, Cliff. Hey. Oh, yeah. There's a hand up over there on the left. Yes, sir. Hey, good job, Jordan. Nice. Last call. No one took the bait. No one's celebrating their mother today. <laughs> I'll double dip, and, and uh, Kim and I had our 11th anniversary Friday, this past Friday, and uh, I survived an e-ticket e ride in my Honda. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man. Uh, well, seeing no others, let's go ahead and stand and go to God with our call to worship.
Our call to worship for this morning reads, God gathers us for worship. Like a mother hen gathers her brood. God teaches us the way of wisdom and peace. Trusting in God, we continually offer our praise. Let's pray. God of generations, we gather in your presence, give you thanks, to celebrate the gift of your motherly love both gentle and fierce, both strong and humble, both kind and true. Lord, your love has given birth to the whole of creation, supports us, nurtures us, cares enough to correct us and challenges us in ways that strengthen and transform us. And so we offer you thank, praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing presence in our lives and for all the blessings you so generously offer us. God of compassion, God of joy, we know that motherhood is a wide spectrum and our life together is big enough to stand in solidarity with all those who have been mothers to us. The unseen and the seen love and grief, for the joy and the struggles of women and mothers, that we uplift all of that to you now. May this hour be an hour of rejoicing and celebrating for all the ways that you have transformed us through motherly love. God, we do ask your blessing today over mothers and those who have been mothers to us. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Today's scripture lesson is found on pages 833 and 834 in your pew Bibles, Luke 2, 41 through 52. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was with a group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. This is the word of God for the, oh, 
And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we were supposed to have wrapped up our series, This Is Us, last week, uh, but a combination of things happened. First of all, I realized it was Mother's Day, and I wanted to say something uh, not just about mothers themselves, but I think about what, what I heard in the youth's prayer, Sunday mothers. I like that term. I might be using it from now on. And second, uh, I realized that You know, I kind of gave you some hard ones the past three weeks. Every week it was, here's something to work on. Here's something we need to be intentional with. We need to hear something that we're already good at for a change. Uh, And so what I did is I went back to the book Growing Young, where the the concept of keychain leadership came from, and I realized that it makes a second point, point in that book. It's a second point that I think we do incredibly well at here. Uh, We just may not have given a name to it. We may not know that we do it well. And so we're, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at what it calls being a, being a warm church. 
But before we get into that, let me tell you, I do not think people are getting lost enough anymore. Have you noticed that? People are not getting lost enough anymore. I mean it. Everyone's got a, a map app on their phone. No, y'all don't know what I mean? You get lost, you just pull out your phone. Five seconds, boom, you're back on track. You don't know where you're going, you just plug it right in. It's too easy. I don't think it's good for us as a society. <laughs> y'all getting lost builds character. No one, no one's with me on this one? All right. Well, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll admit, I use the map app myself. I'm no better than anyone else, but I realize what it's doing to me. You know, I, I just jump in a car now. Just jump in a car. I start going. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going. That's not good for us. Okay, Y'all remember back in the day, right? Y'all remember when you got lost and you were just lost? <laughs> you learned about yourself that way. You know, you had to square yourself up. You had, you had to think twice about getting in the car the next time. You know, it was a harrowing experience. See, first of all, you had to admit to yourself when you got into those scenarios, you had to admit to yourself that you are lost, which is the most painful experience a man will ever go through. And you have to remember if you've ever heard of County Road 55482-9 before. You have to Think about what time of day it is, what direction the sunset is. If you're lucky you had a state map in the, in the glove box, but you dare not pull that thing out because you can't get that thing folded back right. There we go, we're starting, we're getting there. <laughs> and then, all things considered, you really just had to learn to trust yourself and head in a direction. It's frustrating, scary, a, a whole ordeal. I'm here to tell us it made us stronger. We were better people back then. All right, well, that's just a personal opinion at any rate, and apparently not that funny of a personal opinion. <laughs> you know, I can't back that one up with scripture. We don't know if Jesus ever got lost. We know from the one story we have of him as a, a child or a preteen that he got misplaced, but even then he wasn't really lost. Maybe he missed out too. See, I, I'm assuming that most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the scripture reading we have this morning. It's Jesus, he's about 12 years old. He went with his parents down to the temple in Jerusalem. We know that Mary and Joseph, they were traveling in a caravan with their extended family. They must have thought Jesus was with someone else, and so they headed back. They leave him behind, and you can imagine the distress as they learn Jesus isn't with us, as they backtrack on dangerous roads, as they search the capital city of Jerusalem for three days, he could be anywhere. And I'm sure they had a lot of questions, Mary and Joseph, questions that to this day remain unanswered. Where did Jesus sleep during that time? Who made sure he was safe? Now, I suppose most importantly, who kept a 12-year-old boy fed? Those of y'all who have done that, you know that's no small feat. Who did that? We don't get direct answers to that in our scripture reading, uh, but at least what's implied, what's implied is that the community there stepped up. They stepped up for a boy that they didn't know. Right? They saw Jesus and they welcomed him in worship. They welcomed him in their kitchen tables. We see that they, they clearly listened to him. They had this back and forth conversation that by the time his parents caught up to him, he was having these robust theological conversations and everyone was the richer for it. The whole story, it really causes me to wonder and to rejoice in the experience of young folks in our church. You know, see, sometimes I wonder, but more often I rejoice in knowing that, that their experience is a lot like Jesus is here. Not lost, just spending some time with their, their church family. Folks being seen, being heard, welcomed, that sort of thing. You know, and I, I know it's often the case that we have that same exact kind of love and care for people here, for young people, for young adults, single folks just starting out, for those new to the church, new to the community, things like that. It's like overnight, people just become part of the church family. You know, the theologian Miroslav Volf, he, he drew to my attention some time ago that 
Even God himself is a God in relationship. Even before Jesus came to us, even before creation itself, God was, is, and will be a God in relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together as one. And Wolf, he goes on to say that that's a model for the church. We're meant to reflect that image out onto the world. So you all know that, that the church isn't a building, right? Not really. Church is a people. But Wolf, he goes on to push us even farther on that one. He contends that even when we understand that the church isn't a building but a people, we can still shortchange the, the fullness of the relationship God has called us into. See, what he points out is that when we get charged with being the church, with being God's gathered people, we can shortchange it. We can get that big call in our lives and we can say, well, yeah, we're the church. We meet together occasionally. Meeting together is good. I'm not knocking that, but that's not the fullness of what we've been called into. Similarly, we can get that call to be, to be the church, God's gathered people, and we can say, yeah, we're the church. We cooperate and plan mission projects. And y'all know I'm not knocking mission projects either. Those are of key importance, but at the same time, that, that's just not the full picture of what it means to be the church, what it means to be God's gathered people. Instead, Wolf, he points us to Romans 12, 5, a verse that, that gives us such a big call on our collective life as the church that it's almost bound to make us uncomfortable. Let me read it for us. Romans 12, 5, it says, So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Each belong to one another. You know, in a sense, that's, that's always true, isn't it? It's sort of like no man is an island if you're a, a fan of old English poetry. That's kind of like I am he as you are he as you are me and we are all together. You like the Beatles? It's kind of like we are the universe subjectively experiencing itself. You know, if you really like the Beatles. Y'all are not working with me today. I'm getting no laughs. <laughs> The point is, we're, we're interdependent creatures. We really are. Where one of us ends and where another one of us begins is somewhat arbitrary. You know, down to the shared air we breathe, down to the shared lives we live, down to even our personality. You, you show me the five people you spend the most time with, I'll show you who you are as a person. We really do belong to one another. We are not these siloed little creatures. We're interdependent. We're connected. But see, what Wolf points out is, is taking that one step further. He's saying that our shared life, it's, it's meant to be the very definition of being the church. Being the church means sharing our lives together. See? What he's saying is that ultimately, ultimately, we are not a loosely affiliated group of spiritual persons having simultaneous individual spiritual experiences. Ultimately, we are not a civics club that goes and does good work sometimes. Rather, Wolf, as he contends with Scripture, he tells us that we really do belong to one another. We really are one body. We are connected tendon to bone as the church across generations as we collectively work out our faith together. Wolf means that. I think Paul in Romans means that. I think Jesus meant that. We're one body. And I believe that's true here. You know, when a new pastor comes to a church, one of the first things they do, they look over all the systems, all the programs, they make sure things are working right. And one of the first things I recognize is we don't really have a, a visitor onboarding process. We, we have the cards in the back of the pews, and those are good to use. You know, if you're a visitor with us, we, we like to know who's here. But I notice we, we don't really have, pro you go to some churches, some churches, and I'm not saying they're wrong, it's just not our style, but they have the, the iPad and they collect all the info and yet put into an automated email track list and it's just, we don't do that here. Instead, what we do is we just sort of let folks get in to their level of comfort. We just expect and look forward to people making real friendships here. 
people having real relationships here. And that's so much better. You, you can't replace real friendships with an iPad. I've tried. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. But at any rate, uh, what that is, is that growing young, it, it reports that we've really hit the mark on being a warm church. You know, I didn't do that. That predates me, but I do want to brag on it for a minute. You know, we are a warm, warm church. See, most churches, when they, they get into discussions of being intentional with visitors and the like, they tend to prioritize being a cool church. You know what I mean? Discussions start up about screens and fog machines and, you know, video game systems. And Again, that's fine if that's how folks do it. That's just not our style, but... Let me tell you, once those conversations start up, it's like Pandora's box. There's no containing it. But see, uh, we talked about this some when we looked at keychain leadership, but, but the big thing is young folks and new folks and just people who are looking for a community, they are not living or dying based on how cool a church is or how I look in skinny jeans. You know, there's video games, there's all that. All that's at home. That's at home if you want it. What do we offer here? What I believe we offer here, what we offer is that young folks and folks new to the community and all sorts of things like that, they get a warmth here. They get a, an embrace here. Folks who are welcomed and embraced into our shared life, into the church. People all on their own, super organically, just become a part of the body, become a part of the church family here. So like I said, that's something that I think we already do a good job at. Whether it's folks plugging in with Lunch Bunch or with the small groups or taking part in music or, or a ministry, folks have a way of naturally finding the connection they're looking for here. That's something we should celebrate. So with that, you know, I don't really have anything to change or a, a task for us to go out and do. All I want is for us to put that on our scorecard I want us to put our warmth on our scorecard. Whenever someone is cared for, whenever someone's shown hospitality, whenever somebody makes a good, real friendship, I want us to see that that's a huge win. That is a huge win that we just pulled off. What that is, is us acting like the people of faith who welcomed the 12-year-old Jesus. What that is, is us being the church us being pulled together into a shared life. What that is, is motherly love between folks who probably aren't even related. That is, church, that is a mirroring of God's own identity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God in community, a God in relationship, us mirroring that out into the world. And so it's a really simple message today because we're already good at it. People routinely start to feel like part of the, the church family pretty organically here. You know, it may look like somebody uh, just connecting and it, it going well beyond small talk. You know, it may look like engaging others who are outside the, the sort of natural group we, we find. It may look like people who just have sort of a, a Christ-like view of people and quickly just, just get curious about new folks who just want to See what someone else is about. May look like any number of things, but, but we do a good job of it here, taking folks out to lunch and getting to know folks on a deeper level. You know, I think about the, the faith community that Jesus himself interacted with when he was only 12 years old, and what I see is the adults around Jesus, they benefited from his presence. They benefited from his questions. And Jesus, he himself benefited too. Now, there's just so much life and goodness and love whenever you encounter a church that does that, a church that has Sunday moms. By the way, if you're a man, you can be a Sunday mom too. We all grow in vitality when we recognize that we really do belong to each other. That's not just an idea or a, a heady concept, that's the truth. That's what a shared life looks like. So straight ahead, y'all, let's be a warm church.
My mom had a green thumb. She could grow anything. On the farm, we had a few rose bushes. On Mother's Day back then, most people wore roses to church to honor their mothers. There was a red climbing rose growing on the south yard fence. Each of us kids would go out, select, and cut a bloom we thought was the best. Mom helped us pin them on our clothes. My dad wore a white rose because he lost his mom when he was 16. There was a creamy white rose further down the south fence that we call the wedding rose. It was rooted from a cutting of the roses my grandmother carried in her wedding bouquet back in the 19-teens. When we got to church, I looked across the congregation and could see the love and honor everyone had for their mother by the roses we all wore. Today, as we celebrate mothers, we honor Jesus. We all were born by blood into this life through our earthly moms, but we are reborn by the Spirit into eternal life through Jesus Christ. This meal is how we remember him. Please use the outside aisles to come to the table and return using the inside aisles. All are welcome. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, which was the night when he showed us the greatest example of selfless love, of, of a motherly love given to all of us, he took a loaf of bread, he lifted it up, he gave thanks for it, he blessed it, broke it, and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it. He blessed it. He said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Let us come forward.
Please pray with me. Father, thank you for our ability to give tithes and offerings to your church. Lord, as we devote ourselves to prayer, please strengthen our congregation in mission. Direct all our gifts and offerings for the purposes of your kingdom. Father, as we approach the end of our church year and our thoughts turn to budgets and leadership nominees, please lay your hands on our hearts that we may hear your voice and do your will. Lay your hands on our good pastor, Nick, as he does his best to inform us, guide us, and lead us to be your church here in our community and the world. Amen. At this time, if there are any who feel called to join First Christian Church in membership, please do come forward. Seeing none, I do want to remind us that the basis of our unity is Jesus Christ. It is not whether you think I'm funny or not. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, thank goodness. <laughs> Receive now this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>